Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. Um, this is actually a bonus episode. We're, we're not uh, doing these normally, but it's something that we might start doing if uh, you all enjoy them. So this week we're going to be discussing something that's out live right now in the theater. We went and watched it last night as a team. Um, it was myself, Clark, um, and M. And unfortunately, M is unable to, to talk with us today, but... Um, she's thinking about doing an episode with us as a guest in the future, so that's cool. Um, and one other note before we get started discussing it is that we may get a little bit spoilery. Um, we're going to do our best, obviously, not to ruin it, but the way the format's going to work is for the first, like, five-ish, ten-ish minutes, however long that lasts, we're just going to give a brief, hey, this is what we liked about it, um, and would we recommend it kind of a thing without getting into details. And then what I'll do is I'll kind of do a countdown of... Uh, like five seconds, just so people can stop listening, um, put put us away if they want to, go watch it, and then come back and listen after that, where they can hear more uh, deeper details of what we've got going on uh, with the with the movie. Um, but that's basically how the format's going to go. So, um, without much further ado, uh, let's do the synopsis, uh, quick synopsis, and then um, just give our opinions on it. So. Uh, do you have the synopsis up, or do you want me to read it? I, I, I can wing it. Do it. Homeless drunk man decides to change his ways after a former bullshit ghostly experience at an old mansion where his parents, his dad, was possessed by ghosts or some shit and tried to murder him and his, his mom. You know, uh, it's a sequel to that. It's, it's a good a sequel. sequel. It's a sequel to that. <laughs> so yes. it's, uh, yeah. you have Danny returning from The Shining... Uh, he's coming back to kind of become a mentor or Luke Skywalker's Obi-Wan to a new uh, emerging Jedi or, or ghost speaker or person. I, yeah. I love what you're doing here. This is great. So basically, is... you've got a struggling alcoholic in Danny Torrance, the son of Jack Torrance um, from the original film slash book, The Shining. And this movie carries basically picks up his life, what? what they say, 20 years down the line, 30 years down the yep. line, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, that's where we get dropped off. So there is some awesome stuff, though, that happens in this movie. So um, Clark is definitely having a lot of fun with the references to Star Wars, and I love that. Um, but all in all, it is a story about a struggling alcoholic. That That is, to me, that's the root of, of this story. So um, we're going to go ahead and give our opinions now. Uh, like I said, I'm going to give you guys lots of buffer, lots of um, fair warning before we get into the spoilery parts, but what Clark and I are going to do now is we're just going to discuss kind of um, quick what we like um, about it. Did we think it was good, bad, whatever it might be, um, and then quick ratings, and would we let somebody else watch? So I'm going to go ahead and let Clark go ahead and go first, um, and then I'll round it back out. I really want you to go back to what you said earlier with uh, what what you felt the movie was about, with it being about a drunk drunk man's kind of ret return to uh, return to glory story. Is that kind of how you saw it, or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, strong opinions on that. So, um, I I think that Stephen King has some uh, personal issues in life with alcoholism, mm -hmm. and I think the stories that he writes a lot of times. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of themes there's a lot of different things he uses to des describe it but for the shining specifically this story this uh character timeline it's about alcoholism his alcoholism and and his struggle with it um and bringing drugs kind of well. drugs as well but kind of bringing of his personal life into these stories so that others can and can maybe see a shining light for it um I, my father was a struggling alcoholic for many, many, many years. I grew up with him that way. It was, it was rough. My grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, so it's really, really cool to see um, a Jack Torrance who struggles with alcoholism because of his father and a Danny seeing his father and his grandfather kind of that through that. Um, and then Danny is like the final one in the family to struggle with it and deal with it in his own way. So it's really neat. Um, I can definitely connect to that and, and feel a connection there with what Stephen King wrote um, and what Mike Flanagan um, and even a little bit of what um, Stanley Kubrick did with his version of The Shining. So very interesting okay. for me. Okay. So that's that's cool. I'm glad that's how you, how you saw it. 
I kind of picked up more of a is a passing down of the torch uh, story with with regards to how Ewan McGregor's character matched up with the character Abra. Unfortunately, sorry, I don't know the name because I don't. This is the first time I've seen this this girl acting in a movie, uh, and I haven't. Honestly, I didn't go into the IMDb page beyond like Ewan McGregor, but it was uh, really well done. I would have to say that uh, the director for him trying to please fans of the book The Shining uh, he kind of didn't pay attention to people who actually read Doctor Sleep with the way he did the ending which you know they're going to be a lot less upset people because The Shining was is a classic book like a lot of people love that book but with regards to uh, like the, the movie as well huge buzz Stanley Kubrick has his own like fan fan camp so you've always had like the uh the Kubrick camp versus the uh the actual Stephen King camp yeah so I'm just kind of glad that he I don't I don't like the ending he he took he pleased the people from The Shining that book by I don't know Let's talk about that later that's my camp know. but yeah that's my camp yeah <laughs> I'm in the uh I'm in the they're, they're both okay camp uh the book the book has its issues and we could talk about that later, but uh, I don't know. Doctor Sleep, they did a good job. They did a good job. So let's let's uh, let's just boil this down real quick. Um, let's yeah. get this out of the way so we can get into more of the uh, nitty gritty and the more conversational pieces that I think we can have. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, would you tell people to go see this in theater, or would you say pass on it and watch it on video? That's hard. If you are a fan of The Shining, the book, or the me movie, I would say, yeah, watch it in theaters. If you're going into this blind and you haven't seen either, you, ha you haven't read the book, I would say, yeah, you could just, you'll be fine. It's okay. Wait on it? You're saying wait on it? I would I would say, yeah, watch it at some point, but don't, don't really watch it unless you really are in invested in the characters. I don't think it's... I don't think it's a good starting point. I don't think it's something you should watch without having any... Like, watch The Shining first if you're going to watch it. And if you don't like The Shining, then don't watch it. I yes. um, We are in complete agreement on that. Uh, agreement on that. So that's awesome. That's good to hear. Um, Camp, Camp Shining, if you've watched any of The Shining, read any of The Shining, and you want a good finishing piece to either of those, Kubrick's or King's, I think this is a great finishing piece to either of those. Um, personally, I haven't read Dr. Sleep, so um, I have it on order right now. It should be in in the next week or so, and then I'm going to try to breeze through it because I read The Shining, the book, the, uh, for the past two weeks leading up to us going and seeing this movie. I finished it um, actually two nights ago, and I absolutely loved it. And what it did, though, was it put me in the camp of I like King camp, and I don't like Kubrick's camp. And unfortunately, right. that makes me dislike The Shining film more than um, you know I actually originally had. I, I used to love that movie; I thought it was good. Now I feel like it's missing stuff. We'll and have to watch the miniseries at yes. some point. Yes. So this uh, is part it one. The, it does the book justice. It just has worse actors. So we'll have to have a discussion on that versus Kubrick at some point. Perfect. Because this is part one of what we're trying to do—a three-part series. We're doing Doctor Sleep first. Um, and then we're going to do the Shining film and the TV miniseries at a later date. Um, and both of us have now both read The Shining. Um, and only one of us has read Dr. Sleep. But I don't think you need to read Dr. Sleep in order to see this, kind of like with what you were saying. You just yep. need to have seen The Shining or read The Shining or um, even maybe even watched The Shining, the TV miniseries. Yep. That well, might have been good enough. Movie. So yeah. okay. if you've read the book, you've, you're going to have seen the movie just... I don't, yeah. I don't see why you wouldn't have. If if you're that rare individual who hasn't, then uh, yeah, sure, you're gonna be confused at the twins, but yeah, not the good kind of twins, um, the bad kind, the gear, the ghosts, the spirits. Yeah. Um, okay, so this this is a fair point uh, to say stop listening. If you don't want any spoilers about the movies, if you don't want to hear anything. Uh, you don't want to know who dies, who lives, anything like that. That could come up in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes that we talk about it. So I just want to give you guys a fair warning. Um, stop listening right now. Uh, I'm going to give you a soft countdown from five all the way down. And then after that, the gloves are off. Clark's mouth is open.
anything can happen. So here's yep. your soft countdown. Five. Here comes the diarrhea. Four. Three. Two. One. All right. You should have stopped by now if you don't want spoilers. Okay. So now let's get into the real conversation about this film. So um, what did you think about the beginning? The We'll walk through it kind of from beginning to end, I would assume. We might jump around a little bit. But so the beginning of this film, you have a couple of different characters we're meeting right off the bat. I want to hear from your perspective. What do you think about Child Abra? What do you think about Homeless uh, Danny Torrance? And what do you think about um, Snakebite Andy? Because all three of those different characters are kind of thrown at us right at the beginning. And I didn't know what to do with it at first. Okay, so you're talking about the very beginning when there's kind of like the... Uh... It's, it's kind of like somewhat of a montage where it shows like this is happening at this point in time to this character. Now we're going to this character, kind of like a hash map of Game of Thrones yeah. where before these characters interlace or, or meet. Or yeah, that's you see. to me it was their character building, right? It was how they were setting up these characters. So we felt right. a little bit of connection to each of them. Well, it also sets up them being able to go back and forth from each character and you be able to see things from their perspective, yeah. which was it was well done. It was it was decent. Uh Child Abra, the she does she she talks. This is actually the beginning part is is pretty close to the book, and I was like, yeah, this is this is the book so far. Yeah, this is good. Abra having the the spoons fly in the air, uh, showing off that she too has the shining. So, spoiler: this is the the Luke Skywalker that Obi Wan has to train. Yes. And uh, anyhow. Like there's a there's a message she sends on the chalkboard that Owen McGregor lives on. There's a there's some there's something that's a, a little bit more relevant in the book, but kind of relevant in the movie is like he's kind of took money from uh, yeah this girl and he he leaves in the book he leaves her a little bit but takes the rest and uh, like he always dreams back to that moment because there was a little kid there. And he was there's like cocaine on the table and things like that. It was not like a nice home for the kid to be in, and you just kind of left that situation. Question: So, how right. much does Haloran show up throughout the book? What do you mean? Uh, spirit, the... Spirit Halloran, right? So, uh, Dick. So Dick's dead. Everyone knows that. If you don't know that, that's why you're here because you're wanting to find out. So you know Dick's dead right. at this point because even uh, Danny Torrance is much much older. Right, so well, Dick's Dick dead. dies in the book. He he, you know, he doesn't he doesn't die in the book. He does talk to Ghost, uh, Ghost Dan in in Doctor Sleep, like is he's long dead. So the whole ghost thing's there. But him at the beginning talking to the ghost, yes, movie wise, he's been dead. There, right, right. But no, um, so man. when when sorry when Dick shows up and kind of walks him through these moments, I, I always feel like Dick shows up at the tough, crucial moments in Danny's life. Right. So when he's you're talking about the uh, o the possibly overdosed woman with the baby in the apartment. And right. Danny wakes up and he's like, oh my God, she puked all over the place. Or maybe he puked. I don't know whose puke that was, but that was pretty gross. That was her puke. It was com it was right next to her mouth. <laughs> I was uh, eating my hamburger that side. right uh, as they showed that scene. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, anyways, well, so he's stealing the money. That bothers you. You shouldn't be watching a horror movie at the Alamo. <laughs> no, 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 I just shouldn't have. I shouldn't have been eating at that moment. So basically, he's he's taking money back from her because she stole from him. That's what he says. Right. That's his justification. But Dick shows up and he's like, "Hey, like you could at least leave her a little bit, right?" Um, and he doesn't in the movie. And you're saying in the book, there's a different kind of outcome. He leaves a little bit for her and then heads out. Is that what you're saying? There's that's a difference so right there. They don't fully show what actually happens in the movie, I don't think. They just show, like, him, he's having the money in his hands, and then the ghost shows up, and he, it kind of just, you hear, like, money crunk, crimpling, and then he turns around and he leaves. It doesn't show whether he leaves it or whether or not he takes it. I believe, and this is from my memory, so I could be wrong here, it's been about a year and a half since I've actually read the book. He takes most of the money, but he leaves her money for the kid. Okay. And he just, you know, he leaves. And he does see... She has like death flies on her face. Yep. Uh, he talks about that in the movie later on. Like he sees flies on people who are who are going to die, but they didn't show it in the movie. I I think that's it's from my memory. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, no, all that's accurate so far. Yeah. So she she does die. Like she does die in the book. They, I don't remember how they explain it, but they actually tell you how she died, and they explain like the kid too 
I can't spoil that for you, unfortunately. But yeah, uh, very well done. I'm glad that they actually showed her as a Spectre and they put her in the story. I feel that kind of humanized him more as a as a character who grew. Yeah, definitely, because I feel like yeah. during that weird bouncing around from town to town, drunk and alcoholism situation, he didn't have a lot of control over himself either. You know, he tells um, Billy, <clears throat> Cliff Kirk, Curtis's character, he tells him, he's like, hey, like, are you running for yourself or are you running or are you uh, trying to hide or whatever he says? And he's like, basically, I'm, yeah, I'm running from myself. Um, and then Billy right. you know, goes on to mention like, well, you can't. You, you can never outrun yourself. You'll always catch up. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit more about Snakebite Andy because I really loved that character. I thought that was a cool, yeah, um, a cool cat, cool character. So, what did you think of the um, theater scene? How how did it differ from the book partially? And then, um, what it what yeah, what do you got on that? Because I really liked it. Uh, I, I thought it was well done. I think that it was pretty well done. It kind of showed her as they, they did it. They did justice to her character in the book. I, I get how, why they didn't really introduce other things like her lover, but oh, okay. um, yeah, she's one of the not, but anyhow, they bringing her into the fold, however they did it, they did a good enough job that made me feel like, yeah, that makes oh, yeah. sense. Let's, let's bring that up a little bit. Um, Cause you just mentioned it. So, uh, actual synopsis right this is something that you're not going to really this isn't a spoiler at all but just so you guys understand um danny torrance meets this young girl her name's abra and the whole point um of them kind of coming together is because he's got to try to protect her from this cult um the cult is known as the true knot they prey on people who have the shine that's that's it um that's really the whole premise of this movie is that danny's struggling with his own demons alcoholism uh his past all of that but he meets this young girl who has a very very strong shining like he did when he was little so they can connect very easily um, she doesn't know what it is she doesn't know how to control it just like Danny never really has and there's this other group of people so this outside entity that's kind of following these shines shines I guess it shines around Whatever you want to call it, and there's there's they're sucking the steam or shine out of these um, people and yeah. that's how they're living forever. So I, it's funny because my mind goes right away to Suspiria and the witches, the coven in Suspiria, and how they're sucking the life out of these young dancing girls with talent. The more talented girls get eaten faster by these witches so they can live longer. Very similar here to the true knot. Um, that's real life, man. Like If you're good at dancing, they will find you. So those of you who enjoy dancing... Don't do ballet. Um, no. I loved the true knot. I really wanted, I want to see like books on just the true knot and kind of follow them throughout their crazy ass lives because, um, these characters were just so, we got a lot of, 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 I don't know, information in a short period of time and you have a character. So you have the leader, Rose, the hat, her name is Rose. They call her Rose, the hat. Um, I thought she did phenomenal. Then you have, um, Crow daddy, which is like her lover. Is the way I get a feeling? Yes, yes, okay. yes, but he's weaker than her. Sure. So she okay. is the strongest in that group. Then you have Snakebite Andy. She's the girl we were just talking about who the movie right. kind of opens, and this is how you meet Rose. Um, you get a little bit of Rose. Well, I guess that's not even true either because Rose sucks the life right out of Violet. And then... So each one of them has a very... Sp and then the not, they each have like very specific abilities. Yes. So they put her in the group as the pusher, right? Uh, is she the pusher or she's the pusher? She pushes yeah, thoughts on because she you, pushes, like, yeah, sleep. go right. to sleep. That's right. Yep. Uh, there's Apron Annie, who you don't get to really meet a bunch of. Uh, Barry the Chunk, who we get a brief moment of, and he is probably my least favorite member of the knot. Um, you have Grandpa Flick, who you just feel bad yeah. for the entire time. You have Silent Sari, you don't meet her at all. Diesel Doug, you don't meet. Um, Short Eddie, you don't really meet. And that's it. So that's that's the true knot uh, in a quick short list. But I would love to see books about them, kind of their paths of how they became a part of the true knot. That would be a really cool series, in my opinion. They kind of go over it a little bit, but uh, yeah, every character they they followed it and they kind of changed the way the order of the the bad guys kind of getting cut out of the movie. Yeah, but uh, whatever. I I feel like they they only had time to really give 
it was a two and a half hour movie, man. Like it was a yeah, good. You can't give exposition to everyone, which no. I agree with. I, yeah. I didn't... But I think with uh, books, books we could do that. We could get a little bit more love. They did showcase uh, the whatever the snake lady is now. I forgot her name. Snake bite Andy. <laughs> snake bite Andy. Yes, snake lady. <laughs> uh, yeah, obviously I'm terrible with names. Uh, Literally my favorite character in the movie, by the way. <laughs> snake bite Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they. They give out her personality, like I said earlier, like she's gay in the book, she's gay in the movie, and it's, like I said, I'm a little sad that they cut her lover out. The other, one of the other characters in the knot was who she takes to, like they, she's like, you're the most beautiful woman in the, I've ever seen. Thing she says that the, to Rose in the movie. Yeah. Rose the hat. Yeah. It's just like, you just kind of threw it in there. Like. It was almost like a hat why? tip. Not a true blue like keep it true to the book but a little bit of like hey we're recognizing that she is attracted to females but we can't give her too much and i don't know why yeah. i don't get that either um we had a couple there was a couple in the true knot in the film um i want to say it was like silent sari and diesel doug or you know maybe those were the two that, right. that had the relationship but it was quiet it was never even an item they didn't talk about it like i said most of these characters in the true knot we didn't get a lot of detail you know, on their backstory. The book does justice better to that, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah. well, you get to hear the characters. Each of them has a personality. You get to know them a little bit from there. Oh, my God. I can't there's freaking more, wait. <laughs> there's more exposition regardless. It's a book. It's a yeah. Stephen King novel. Uh, yeah, you actually get to see what's going on in their minds from their own narration. Oh, the movies, movies are a bit different. You can't really get the same, same amount of information. But I can't wait. The book's going to be so good. Um, I think yeah. it's just going to help build this, I don't know, this universe for me and, and kind of nightcap it for me because I really enjoyed this. This was a lot of fun, yeah. um, especially reading the book before going into this, uh, reading The Shining before going in and seeing Dr. Sleep. I, right. thought, that was, I thought that was a, a really smart um, choice because if I had just watched the original Shining and then seen this, I would have missed out on so yeah. much. Um, okay, so let's not get too off track, sorry, because um, right. no, no. I'm still... I'm still so like we, excited about The Shining. Um, we but did Doctor Act Sleep. One, which was the prologue, and then you have the uh, Act Two, which is the uh, the actual training, the coming of, the uh, preparation. Yeah. You have Act Three, the first conflict, then you have Act Four, the villain's retribution, which was the villain seeking retribution. So let's. Uh, so okay. So Act Two. So the training. Um, yeah, man. What what begins the training for us? Is it um, Danny getting into the apartment? I would say they were they were acquainted at that point. Yeah. Like, uh, Abra was talking to Danny via, via his chalkboard. Truck, chalkboard. <laughs> I they didn't show how she was getting the messages, which I don't I don't care. But, but you know how. how Danny was getting. We know how. Right. Because she can straight up travel from her mind anywhere she wants to if she puts enough power to it. That's where it shows. I, I thought that was uh, I don't very. I think she traveled there, but she did have a conversation. I don't. That that's a, that's an interesting theory for the movie. Because yeah. uh, they don't ever give you the answer, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. But okay. uh, why? How no. did how did Danny get the best room in the house? So like, it's it seemed like he was staying in an attic. Yes, but that attic was beautiful. Like I would pay an Airbnb to take me there. His view from the window was looked like town center and then yeah. the ocean line. Uh, yeah. And then he had like, it looked huge. I mean, the room looked huge. That's like, fair. Like, I, I didn't even, I just kept I thinking in my head, like in some ladies, like <laughs> middle Eastern, <laughs> yeah, like Midwestern American, like attic. This is how big the attic is. You can stay up here. He decorated, I guess over time. He did. I mean, eight years, yeah, my man. my husband was real handy. Eight years passed in him yeah. living there. Um, so basically, uh, like we said, this is spoilery. So just, you know, remember, if you're still listening and you don't want spoilers, I'm sorry. He's eight years sober at this point. Right. Um, he's, Billy and him have become best friends. Eight years have gone by. They work together now in the town center. Um, he's building a relationship in this town uh, in New Hampshire. And, um, you know, he's actually enjoying his life again. And... Um, that's really where I think things start to I, I think there's a little bit of like his shine gets stronger. 
um, throughout having that conversation with Abra a lot. He may not be using his shine to his uh, true knowledge, but they say as you get older, your shine gets darker and dirtier. But as you drink, your shine must affect, or must affect your shine as well. Because she said it tasted like whiskey at the end of that movie, right? When she was sucking up his steam, she's like, ooh, you taste like whiskey. Um, so I wonder right. if that stuff affects your shine. I have no explanation or any <laughs> any understanding of how they how they made that into a science like uh, i think they're just throwing shit at a wall there um it was it was there but uh yeah so so basically uh him and abra become good friends yep um and conversations every day it gets to the point where he's telling her shouldn't you be getting ready for school stuff like that right um and uh let's see she comes to him for training yes she comes to him she shows up and he's like I'm gonna oh. like a pedophile if you come visit me. Hold on, but why? So we gotta say why. We can't. I feel like we should justify why she comes to him. She uh, she witnessed the the knot. Uh, this isn't the first time she's witnessed it. She witnessed them taking the steam from someone, mm -hmm. or they're shining, or or however you want to explain it. And it's how they they feast. It's how they live long, as Curtis explained earlier. It was just. And she gets terrified. She calls him Baseball Boy. And she finds Ellen McGregor's character, Danny. And she, she says, hey, uh, I'm in trouble. And he's like, oh, great. Uh, I can't help you. You know, I, I don't want to look like a pedophile. Just <laughs> just hide. Hide from him. Yeah. Uh, just don't give me any shit. I just, I just got my shit together. I don't want this. Am I? No, no, no. Please take care of it yourself. And she's like, oh, fine. And the trap that she sets for uh, Rose the Hat is during pretty, that sequence pretty damn was, good. I mean, if you're coming at this fresh from the from the from like you, no understanding of like what happened in the book, like what, what did you think was going to happen before? Uh, before, like when he like, gave up on her, kind of a thing. When when Rose is in her mind. So I would have definitely thought that um, Rose would have been victorious, and that Rose would have kidnapped her kind of a thing you right know, I, th I i would have assumed that rose would have got the upper hand danny's character would have then had to come in and play hero rescue the princess kind of thing get her from the castle oh princess is in another castle whatever do it all over again and then he officially rescues her but um no that scene that this portion of the film definitely blew my mind because i didn't expect right. such a young girl to be so strong that was when you start seeing the battle of the wits between her and Rose, which is very well done in the book as well. Like if you've seen the, uh, there's a show called Death Note. It's a Japanese show, but uh, there's a there's a battle of the brains, which is very epic and uh, it's pretty famous. But uh, L versus uh, Kira, okay, or Light Yagami. Oh, when you have like these these battles of the battles of the brains and like you don't expect them to twist in their plots or their plans of how they're gonna stop someone from entering their brain and stealing their information and knowing where they are, and then they like twist it on them and I don't know. Well done. Nice. Lots we'll have twists. to we'll have to watch Death Note together sometime. Um, yeah. I haven't watched Death Note since I graduated high school. Um, God, that's been like twelve years. Okay, so that awesome stuff happens. She totally tricks Rose. It's great. Uh, this is the first time I think I've seen someone get hurt using their powers as well. Um, right. I thought they were untouchable in that state, and you learn very quickly that you are they are not untouchable. In fact, they're just as fragile, if not more fragile, in that state because they are these immortals. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second to talk about their eyes because I think – I keep forgetting to talk about um, the True Knot's eyes. So their eyes actually shine. You can mm -hmm. see the shine. Um, when they activate their powers, it is almost tapping into their tank of steam that they've been breathing in. Um, mm -hmm. Danny's eyes do not shine. Um, Abra's eyes do not shine. And I think... They turn I'm white. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they turn well, completely white. Yeah, there's... there's yeah. That's yeah. that's movie stuff though. Like they're in a trance. Believe it. Look, their eyes are white. Right, right. But I think so. Rose's Rose does that too when she goes into her sleepwalk mode, right? When she oh. leaves her out of body experience. My what I'm trying to um, 
just talk about or, or make a point about is the shine is almost like someone who's taken another person's life or their life force. So you can see that they've tainted themselves. And now their their eyes are this ticking time bomb or fuel tank almost. Because when it runs out, it runs out. They're dead, right? We've seen, you see uh, some of the true not get bit, right? And And how they die is not a very comfortable, painless experience. It's not good at all. But my, I was just trying to point out how their eyes actually shine. You can see the shimmer. Mm-hmm. Almost like in Blade Runner when you can see the robot's eye, you know that they're a robot, right? Um, but Danny's and Abra's doesn't because they've never stolen another person's shine. Not sure how... how explain that. like how that happens, like why they're, they're, they're getting sick and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I want you to, like, if you, when you do read the book, like, expect that knowledge of, like, oh, so this is why... Like Grandpa Flick, yeah. Oh, okay. so right. the book gives a little bit more information there too. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. they do mention it in the movie. Yes. But they don't go into. You're right. They, Crow Daddy doesn't have time to go into detail. He just basically books. says, "Come on, Grandpa's sick." If you, have the, if you have the time and the patience, books are always better. But most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time, um, but yeah. So, anyways, I just want to talk about the eyes for a second because I thought that was kind of cool. The difference there, even though they all have the shine. Only people who have taken another person shine, their eyes shine in a weird way. The others don't seem to. Um, but moving on, so Danny in that eight-year span also gets a really cool job. And this is kind of the premise of the book title slash movie title. And I want to hear your opinion on how – do you feel like that was done right in the movie or not? Um, but basically, he goes and works as a, a caretaker in a hospice uh, facility. And as these folks are dying, this cat – goes to the room that the person is going to die and comforts them. That's what the cat does. It just lays at their feet and comforts them and lets them know, hey, tonight's your night. These people are dying in a pretty peaceful way. They're just going, right? So Danny will go in and actually talk with them and he'll use his shine. And this is where I was saying maybe his shine got better the the less alcoholic he was. His shine got better again because he would have these conversations in their memories. Um, So yeah, I'd love to hear from your opinion, just knowing that you've seen the book or read the book, or seen the movie, did they do it well, not do it well? Like, what, what can people expect? So, yeah, sure. Uh, him, this is where he gets the titular name, Dr. Sleep. Yep. This is why the movie's called Dr. Sleep. It's based off of, he's he's an orderly for, at this, what is it again? It's a, uh, where, where people basically go to die. It's a hospice. Yeah. A hospice, yeah, exactly. And... I think the reason why he's not drinking alcohol is he's trying to face his demons and he's trying to get past them. And I feel that his drinking deafened the shining or his ability or Tony, whatever. And I feel (laughs) that that was what they're trying to portray in the film. They're like, yeah, he wants to just live his life and be able to kind of get through his past because it was rough and hard on him. Um, which, you know, ghosts are still coming after him, like physical monsters and ghosts are still chasing this yeah. person. And they've shown up recently in his adult life, like a couple of years ago, but he's still, he's still not certain on a lot of things. But him putting those, him kind of mur- not murdering him, suggesting the old people, hey, rest, you're, you're passing away, rest. That was uh, well done. And they showed it about three times. They're like, hey, relate to this character. He's... He's basically uh, suicide. What it was it like? Supported suicide, assisted suicide. Basically, yeah. I mean, he never killed anyone, right? He never let anyone kill themselves or anything like that. But he was right. basically just there as as they passed away, and he didn't do anything to help prolong yep. that. Um, he did ask. Movie. Yeah, he, he was did talking ask. Talking about hey, get assisted suicide if you feel like it. It's I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to touch that. There was, a, there was a moment where he's talking with one of the older gentlemen and you feel like that guy might be in pain just from his face yeah. that he's making. So uh, Danny asks him, like, hey, do you want me to go get the nurse to get you a pill? And the guy's like, no, 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 it won't help anyways. Like these, these folks that are in hospice, they have this understanding that it's, you know, eventually their, their time is coming to an end sooner rather than later, unfortunately. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a tough. That was a tough part of the movie. There was because, uh, man, there's just a few where you're like, "Wow." Um, it's a very controversial uh, thing. 
Well, and, really and at the end, about. Danny's just sitting there, kind of reading a magazine while the person dies, like not, um, no longer fighting it, just there as a supportive role in the death. You know what I mean? Like he thinks he's there to comfort them, to bring yeah. them peace. But that's Which, how he gets the name Doctor Sleep. They right. even the patients begin to refer to him as Doctor Sleep. Uh, okay, so getting past that weird moment in the movie that was kind of tough. Um, let's see. So we get on to where does that leave us? Act three. I would say kind that's of after, to... after the murders happen, yep. after like Abra is coming to him regularly, and uh, he he takes his friend with him. He's first. He's the he's the reluctant tutor. He's that like I can't train you, kid. I. I like had a look at the past, and I just—he's—he's like, he's the guy that's just kind of looking off into the distance, and he's just like, "I can't do this again." Yeah. But then he softens up at the end. And he's like, "Oh, you're all right, kid." And, and he helps out. And then he yeah. sacrifices himself at the end, and he... everybody's like, "Honestly, uh, I was pretty bummed, to be to be fair, um, that in the movie." Danny Torrance does not make it out. Um, right. But Aber does. Aber makes it out. She's okay. And, um, you know, they bring back the Overlook, so that's cool. For yep. those of you who have only seen the Shining film, this is not a shock to you. The Overlook still does exist. It didn't die. Um, but for those of you who have only read the book, you don't expect the Overlook to be there. You expect it to be burnt down years ago and it not to exist. But let me let me just tell you now, Mr. Flanagan did a great job of honoring both the book and the film in a way that you kind of feel okay either way. Whatever fence, whatever camp like we talked about, whatever camp you might have been on, the way that Flanagan did the, the ending of this movie, I feel like he kind of gave each person um, a job well done, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, sure. I I feel like he essentially said, hey, uh, sorry, the Shining ending was messed up. Here, we're gonna put it on this movie instead. Yes, I, which I know bugs you a little bit. <laughs> I don't like it. I think it was stupid. I was just yeah. like, why? Why? So basically... It's already gone. Just go with what they had. Look, in the end of now, nope. nope. Spoil it. You oh, can't spoil the, the book. Doctor Sleep is is just so different. It's just. <laughs> oh, I hate it. You can't spoil the it. book. We're talking about the movie. Jeez, it's so bad. I, I hate it. Like her walking inside the building and seeing like the blood and she's like that's some blood right there and she just walks right by it's just no I, I okay so here's my defense on that right she is so badass that 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 doesn't affect her she oh is... yeah she she's strong a uh, hallway just dripping blood like she understands that the building she's in is also trying to eat her and she's just kind of like walking off like yeah i'm not afraid of this but then then Danny's brain j demons come out and eat her, and I'm like... Oh, we left that out! Okay, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about that. So, as, over time, Danny's getting re... To Clark just... So, sorry. This is the first time Clark and I have done a video version of the podcast where we see each other. And the minute I start getting all, like, girly and giddy about the... the, the I don't know what to call them, the caskets that he's putting these demons in. Clark just kind of looks away like, yeah, whatever, go ahead, Curtis. They are, they are music boxes. They're music <laughs> lo they look like music boxes, They're but yep. with locks. Yep. They don't actually have music box in them. They're empty. No, and they have something even far better inside of them. He traps all the ghosts from the movie, not from the book. Correct. He traps the ones from the – well, one of them's from the book. Yep. But two of them. Sorry, two. Isn't and his dad trapped in one? No, I think his dad was in the house because yes. he didn't unlock the boxes at yeah. that point. Yeah. yeah, that was that was stupid. I wish they didn't put that in there. The I'm Bart, the you. Lloyd scene. I'm finally facing you, Dad, and I'm gonna say, yeah, no to alcohol. Yeah, so the box away. Like, no, come on, man, that was terrible. That scene did not need to be in the movie, and he did not even look anything like Jack Nicholson. Is that in the book? Is that bartending scene in the book? I don't think so. I don't because the that. overlook's not in the book, right? That's the big well, deal. He, I, I think he does confront his father quite a bit, and I, I feel like there may be a scene where he's actually facing off against his father. Okay. But uh, I don't remember. So it's throughout been the a long time. So throughout the the time that he becomes sober and whatnot, he's battling these demons. And Dick Halloran had 
spirit form told Danny how to trap these demons inside of these boxes and say, lock them in there and put them away in the back of your mind and just leave them there. Don't let them out. So over right. time, he's locked up. I don't know. What is it like 15? It looks like of these boxes maybe in his mind. I think there's eight. I don't remember. Yeah, quite like frankly. all these. It, it was it wasn't double digits. Okay, but a bunch of demons. Just we'll say a gaggle of geese were locked away in his mind, and um, at the end of the movie, when he's getting attacked by Rose uh, in the Overlook Hotel, which obviously is not how the book ends, but that's how they decided to do it for the movie to appease both of the camps from The Shining. Um, right. So so he's being attacked by her, and then. He's like, you don't, uh, what does he say? He's like, um, you don't know where you're, no, you don't know where you're standing, puts her in the hedge maze. Yeah. Which is also a really good scene, in my opinion, the running through the hedge maze snow. Um, another knife, good trap. Another the well. slitting her, being behind her. Yeah. Abra slicing her knees. Boom. Boom. That was a good chess match right there, too. And they almost had Rose her. coming out, and she was like, yeah, wait a second this is bullshit and she's like fuck this i'm out boom yeah just jumps right out yeah should have done that in the first place she thought she was in abra's mind still though that whole time um but real realistically she didn't realize she was actually in danny's mind she um, could have left at any time yeah i'm just saying like why did you just decide now to leave i think because she thought she was stronger and that she thought she was better and her oh, she arrogance she was in abra's mind and she didn't realize she was in someone who was almost as strong as her but not equal yeah but the two of them are greater than her well abra okay so i think in the book there there may have been some difference in like abilities and stuff but i don't i don't remember all that crap i felt like him kind of jumping in her mind as as a tool them actually showing that in the movie was fantastic like oh i haven't had a hangover like this in forever i'm 10 Oh my god, that was adorable. The guy, like, the guy being like, oh yeah, you're out. And him instantly realizing, hey, this isn't an adult. Because it takes... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so Crow, uh, Daddy, Crow Daddy in the movie is driving Abra back to Rose. Um, right. He officially... He, he kidnapped her. Um, the rest he of the... Drugs. Yeah, the rest of the not um, shit happened. Uh, I'll let you figure all that stuff out for yourselves. But So Crow Daddy's driving... Abra back. You've probably already seen it if they're watching past this point. Super drugged, hopefully. Super drugged. And then um, Danny's like, here, let me try a new trick. So he jumps into Abra's body and then takes control of it. He's not all drugged up. So he's able to talk, move, act, whatever, totally normal. And that's when, uh, Clark, you were describing the conversation between them um, perfectly. <laughs> And, oh, my God, it was such a funny scene. Like, I felt the humor throughout this movie was still pretty good. It wasn't, like, overly funny or underly funny. I think it had a good yeah. amount of humor throughout. Yeah, they, uh, they made it kind of goofy in some scenes, but it was it was serious. It was, it was a serious movie. What did I say to you last night? It was the 2019 version of Doctor Sleep, not the whenever it was written version, just because of the way they did the humor. I felt it was like there was a little bit of this opening where – that... Well, it was tongue in cheek, which I which I appreciated. It wasn't like uh, it wasn't like hoo like, like right. what crap. Yeah. Like it wasn't like the cheap dick jokes in the It movie. It was, you know, a bit better. Yeah, good. But um, but yeah, I thought that scene was really funny when Danny takes over. So basically, Danny takes over Aver's body and then uh, realizes that Crow is not wearing his seatbelt. So he jerks the wheel into a tree. Crow goes flying, dies. Um, Abra right. saved. And then as Abra's... I thought this was a really neat scene too. As Abra's walking down the street, Rose then kind of out of her body experiences in front of her and tries to scare her. We as viewers watching the movie, you can very clearly tell that that's just like a specter. It's a, It looks like a ghost. It does not look like a person. You can see through it, right? It's translucent. So Abra, being the badass that she is, isn't scared of it and just walks right through it. It fades in this awesome mist, and then Abra just keeps walking. Rose then gets pissed off, though, and <laughs> goes into her little china cabinet and sucks up every shine or every bottle of steam that she's got to go full power. Super Saiyan Rose. Right. Well, they wanted to showcase, hey, this is her at her, at her best, and she's coming at her best, at her yep. peak. Um, she's lost her whole family. She's lost everyone. She's on a path for vengeance. 
she wants to get rid of this girl for killing off the only thing that she had, like her family, basically. Yeah. Um, and if, if you understand the knot, it's essentially, hey, we want to live and we have to devour people and it's just part of the natural circle. Their slogan is live, live long, eat well, and long, eat well. basically she tells Snakebite Andy though, because Andy's like, wait a minute, we don't live forever. And uh, Rose tells Andy, like, I never told you we live forever. No one ever said that to you. I said right. live long, long, eat well, and we well, have she, not been eating well. She even said at the very beginning, oh, live 100 years, go from 15 to 17. Like, so obviously you're going to age at some some rate. Yeah. I don't know. And, and Father but Flick the book had... has way more information, you said, I was going to say yeah, about Grandpa they, Flick. She even says, oh, you were with the, the – uh, the Romans and whatnot. He was he's at least a thousand thousand years old, if not like. You've seen the gladiators 2000. fight, yeah. You've seen the gladiators yeah, so. fight. You've you've eaten kings and princes. Um, he's clearly lived thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they're gonna all have to. I, I'm. Just, it's just their food is getting more and more rare because people shine less and less. Maybe because they're they're fishing for him. Who knows? But whatever happens, social was... commentary. That's social commentary right there. That's like a little hat tip at how our world is devolving and we're ruining our own ecosystem. And I mean, that's just that's it. That's what it is. That's what they're trying to do with it right there. Um, very. I don't, I don't think that was that was one of the thoughts in writing this book. I think it was just like we're going to create a natural order and. These people aren't going to be able to find as much of this food source as they used to. So it's just natural. Natural. Okay. Yeah, man. You, you get less and less food sources. Your population tends to get smaller and smaller. And I know. I just – I feel like yeah. the comments, the way they said it in the movie because I haven't – like I said, I haven't read the book yet. But in the movie, yeah. they, they mentioned how people drink more. People smoke okay. more. People do all these things. They eat terrible, whatever. And Crow even mentions like they don't taste as good as they used to yeah. because of what they're eating or they're drinking. So I wonder if maybe Flanagan, I don't know if the book mentions it like that, but maybe Flanagan was trying to make that social comment then maybe. Um, mm. Interesting. When I read it, I can't, like I said, I am so pumped. Yeah. I can't wait to freaking read it. We have been talking though for 49 and a half minutes about this and I feel like we've done Sorry. it pretty good justice. I, Yeah. Uh, spoilers for the movie. Uh, house blows up. Finally blows up. Danny is Danny is Dan. Danny is uh, Jack Torrance from uh, from The Shining. At the end, that's yeah. what they did. They turned him into Jack Torrance, and they show some nice little. All right, so now Obi Wan has taken the spot of Obi Wan as being a ghost dad for Abra. Yes. And he says, shine on, little girl. And the little girl's like, I'm going to take that to heart, and I'm going to shine on. And then she tells her mom, hey, I was talking to my dead friend. No, no, no. Hold on. Because <laughs> she doesn't. Like, All right. <laughs> she, she says, like, girl, she does. She's like, I was talking to my dead friend, Dan. Uh, no, when she had, first walks out, her mom dad. goes. <laughs> he and dad, they're, they're happy. They're happy. All right. So don't be upset about that, mom. Mom's like, you're not wrong. You're Why not are you wrong. fucking with me, kid? But the order of events, okay? The order of events. He says, shine on. <laughs> the mom pops in and goes, hey, Abra, who are you talking to, sweetie? And she goes, no one. Right away, her first instinct still is don't say a thing. Then she walks out and she goes, actually, mom, I was talking to someone. And then yeah, she well, does she what you said. she lied first, but then she decided, you know what, I did something wrong. Well, good, because it took Danny 30 years – 30 years to get over his bullshit, and it took Abra only five minutes, so that's good. <laughs> hey, Danny went through a lot of shit, okay? I don't want you judging him. Don't throw any judgment at Danny. All I still say a croak, ma uh, a croak mallet would have been better than a axe. That's all I'm saying, Kubrick. You fucked that oh. up. Oh, well, it wasn't Kubrick. That was uh, this guy he still used the axe. He's like, it's iconic. Everybody's going to... Oh, I'm talking from the first movie. I just went on a rant about The Shining just to, just, just because I can. <laughs> Should have just used the axe in this or the Himalayan in this movie then. Like, it, it's he fine. He could have. It, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know who they're trying to please with this movie. It was Everybody. A sequel. It was a sequel to The Shining. That's all it was. And it was okay. I give it four out of three stars. Four out of three stars. I like it. 
Okay, I give it I give it a strong nine out of ten. I really like this movie. I'm probably gonna go see it again in theater um, if I find time. Uh, we saw it at the Alamo. You get food and drink. They made a drink called the Red Rum. It was terrible. Don't ever it order it. Like uh, cough syrup. I thought it was worse than cough syrup. I love cough syrup. I thought it was, it was worse cherry than cough, cough syrup. syrup. It was like they used uh, vermouth instead of actual cherries. They did it use vermouth. Ugh. It wasn't good. Okay, the tomato meter right now, as of now, it's 226. It's got a 73%, which is pretty good. Audience score yeah, is a that. is a 91% out of 1,500 ratings, which is pretty strong. That's pretty good. I'm going to write a review uh, probably today just to throw my opinion out there on it and give yeah. it a rating. Um but yeah, I think right. I would tell anyone watching, if you're a fan of The Shining, book, movie, yeah. TV, miniseries, I don't care, go see Dr. Sleep. If you haven't yeah. seen it at all, don't go see it, please, because it's not going to make any sense to you, and you're probably going to have a shitty opinion because you're a shitty person and you don't know what you're doing. I'm just saying, like, you might. This is one of those things that you either like or you don't. Agreed. I and love you I all. earlier. I love you all. Uh, I want you guys to hang out more often. So here's what you need to do. You need to go follow us right now on two, the number two, Guys Horror Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can check us out on Anchor FM under Two Guys and Some Horror. That is the name of our show. I am Curtis. This is Clark. Clark, say hi. That's hi. video. <laughs> and yeah, hi. so hey, follow us. Like us. Do all of the things you need to do. Subscribe, follow, whatever it is, whatever social media platform you do it on. Because by doing that, you help justify us doing more things like this bonus episode um, that we decided to throw together on a random Saturday after we went and saw the movie on a Friday. So we really like doing this. We don't plan on stopping doing this anytime soon, as far as I know, unless Clark has any other ideas. Um, but we're I'm, I'm brainstorming. I'm coming up with more stuff that we can do just to get more content out there. Yes. Yes, brains storming. Uh, thank you all. Uh, had a wonderful time. Check us out on our uh, social media at Two Guys Some Horror. Did I say that right? Uh, on our social media, Two Guys Horror Pod. Two Guys Horror Pod. That's on social media. That's on Instagram and that's on Twitter. Also, check us out on Spotify. We are uh, Two Guys and I'm, Some Horror. Two Guys and Some Horror. And what are the other channels we're on, Curtis? So we're on iTunes. We are on uh, Anchor. The, the best thing to do is just head to Anchor, look for Two Guys and Some Horror, and you'll be able to get to all of the ways to listen to us. There's over like six different ways. I can't even think of them off the top of my head right now. Mm. But we're out there, man. We're out there. Yeah. We are nine episodes strong. This is a bonus episode, and we appreciate every single one of you for listening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.